I've mentioned vital signs multiple times already, so let's talk about them. What are vital signs good for? How do we get them? And then how do we interpret them? How do we use them going forward? They appear in both the trauma assessment and the medical assessment, but if you notice, remember on the trauma assessment side, they appeared last. On the medical assessment side, they appeared first. Let's first talk about what vital signs are and how we get them. The first thing is heart rate, right? abbreviated HR, heart rate. A heart rate is achieved by getting a patient's pulse. There are lots of pulse points on your body. We're going to use a few of them, the main ones, to get our heart rate. Let me talk about where they are. The first one is your radial pulse. The radial pulse is on the thumb side. You're going to find it if you come down to the base of the thumb, just in here. Now, some people is a little further out. Some people it's a little further in, a little further up, a little further down. Some people have to push a little harder. Other people it's a little lighter touch. You're going to practice all these skills when we get together for your practical sessions. When you're taking that pulse, you want to put your fingers on it, not your thumb. Always use your fingers. Put your fingers on it and count the beats you feel in 15 seconds. Once you get that number, multiply by four. That will give you your beats per minute or your pulse. Now, a number is great, but that's not the whole story of a heart rate. I can get that number on the radial pulse. We already talked about the carotid pulse, but remember, we only use the carotid pulse generally in unresponsive patients. We do have other pulse points around. We'll talk about those when we get to blood pressure. But the number is great, but it doesn't tell me the whole story. If I get a patient's pulse and their pulse is 80, that's just a number in time. I need a little more information. So as we're getting a pulse or a heart rate, I want to get three things. Rate, rhythm, quality. Rate is that number, 80 beats per minute. Rhythm is regular or irregular. Is the pulse regular? Is it a steady beat I'm feeling? Or is it an irregular beat underneath that I'm feeling? And quality means describe it. Is it a really strong pulse? Is it a weak pulse? Is it really hard to find? Rhythm and quality are more important than the actual number. The average beats per minute is 60 to 100. Now that's an average. What that means then is that there are people who are low, below 60, and there are people that are high or above 100. It also depends on what you were doing. If you were just sitting on a sunny rock on the side of the trail, you might have a very low pulse rate. And if you were just trail running, you might have a very high pulse rate. But in those situations, neither one of them means you're in distress. So we always have to take context into play when we're dealing with pulse. So a number's nice. But again, I could have 80. I could have 80 regular and strong, or I could have 80 irregular and weak. So when you're getting a pulse, count the beats in 15 seconds, multiply by four, but then pay attention, regular or irregular, and what is the quality like? That tells me about your heart rate. The next one is respiratory rate or breathing rate. Now I mentioned earlier that it's actually really hard to get a breathing rate on a person. It is. Next time you're around people, take a moment and try to count someone's respiratory rate. Not someone who is just exercising or who's breathing really heavily, just someone who's sitting there normally breathing. What you're gonna find is it's really difficult. The reason is that normal breathing doesn't look like anything. You've all been watching me this whole time and you haven't seen my chest heaving in and out. You haven't been able to count my respirations, yet you would all say that I'm breathing normally. Well, you know that because I'm sitting here talking to you. When it comes to respiratory rate, getting a number is good, but it can be very difficult. The nice thing is, is if someone's breathing hard, if they are having a hard time breathing, it's actually easy to count the number because they're breathing either really, really fast or really, really slow. What I care about more, what you care about more, is rhythm and quality. Get a number. Now the average breaths per minute for a resting individual is 12 to 20. 
12 to 20 breaths per minute. A breath is in, out. That's one breath. And again, that's an average. Some people are lower, some people are higher. Think about context. Were you just running? Or were you just napping? But if someone is breathing at 16, that's nice. But I still want to know, is it 16, regular, not working hard? Is it 16, irregular and shallow? Give me rhythm and quality. Even more importantly than number, rhythm, and quality is actually paying attention to their work of breathing. How hard is your patient working to breathe? How hard are they trying to move air in and out? The harder a patient has to work to move air in and out means they're expending a lot more energy. They're going to tire quicker and they're going to lose their ability to continue to breathe in and out faster. So get a number, but get rhythm and quality and look at work of breathing. How hard do they have to work to breathe? The next one is what's called skin, color, temperature, and moisture. This is a little misleading in the way that it's laid out, but this is the term that we use in the medical world, skin color, temperature, and moisture. I'm trying to find out what your skin color, temperature, and moisture is. Now, we're gonna give you what the normal is, and then if you find something other than that, you'll just report it. All of the things that you find mean something, which you'll learn later on with the different conditions that we talk about. Let's go backwards. Skin color, temperature, moisture. If I were to ask you that to touch the skin on your hand or on your face, and I say, what kind of moisture content should it feel like? You would say dry. You should feel dry. The normal average everyday person at rest should feel dry. Not parched not soaking wet, just dry. If it's something different than that, we want to make note. Temperature. Again, if I were to ask you to just touch your skin, what would the temperature be? You should say warm. We should feel warm. The average skin temperature is about 90 degrees. That should feel warm to you. If the patient is really, really hot or the patient's really cold, that tells you something. This is where the weird one comes in. Color. Now I'm gonna ask you, the color that we use is actually the color the world round that we're looking for. The problem is, is it's not actually skin color that we're looking for. This is just the way it got labeled. We are looking for pink. If you are a healthy individual that is perfusing blood around your body to your end organs, meaning you're moving blood around your body, your skin color should be pink. But like I said, it's not your skin color we're looking at. What you're technically looking at is the inside of their gums or the inside of their eyelids, their mucous membranes. Those mucous membranes on everybody around the world should appear pink. Pink tells me that they're getting oxygenated blood all the way out to the last ends of the capillaries. In lighter skinned people, we can look at a patient's skin color because it manifests through uh, easier. In darker skinned individuals, it's harder to see, and so we look at the mucous membranes. But remember, what we are actually looking at is mucous membranes. So it should be pink, warm, dry. The next one is pupils. Now, pupillary response, we're gonna put under the vital sign category, but pupillary response is something that we use only in specific situations. The other thing you need to know about pupillary response is that by the time a patient's pupils have changed, it means something really bad is going on. Now, pupils can change very rapidly in a patient, depending on the situation. But if a patient's pupils change, it is very bad. That's because of the mechanism that's involved in causing a patient's pupils to change. So we will look at patient's pupils to tell us what might be happening. But as we talk about some of these conditions, just remember that pupils are a late sign, meaning that when they change, we are really at the end of being able to do anything for someone. So what should your pupils look like? Well, the average individual, uh, their pupils should be equal, meaning that they're the same size. They're round, that would indicate that there's no trauma to the pupil, and that they react to light. 
Meaning when I shine a light in one of your eyes, your pupil constricts. When I remove the light, your pupil opens up. And they should do that symmetrically. So if I shine a light in your right eye, it should constrict as well as your left eye. And I shine a light in your left eye, it should constrict as well as your right eye. The acronym we use is PEARL. Pupils, P, equal, E, round, R, and reactive to light, R, L. That's what your pupils should look like. Blood pressure is going to be our final vital sign that we're going to talk about right now. Now, blood pressure is something that you're not going to get in the back country. I'm going to tell you how you are going to use blood pressure to monitor your patient. But to get a true blood pressure, you actually need a blood pressure cuff. There are very few circumstances that you're going to be carrying a stethoscope and a blood pressure cuff with you out into the back country. Does it happen? Absolutely. If you're going on a much bigger expedition, if you're going to be out for much longer, if you're going to more remote places and you need to monitor blood pressures, then you need to know how to do that. We're not going to cover the use of blood pressure cuffs in this particular class, although if you're interested, we definitely cover blood pressure cuffs in a wilderness first responder class, as well as a lot more material. How do you use blood pressure? Blood pressure is a sign of my ability to get blood out to my end organs, out to my body, to keep my vital organs perfused with oxygenated blood. Blood pressure is a measure of the amount of force I need to push, my heart needs to push against my vessels to get blood out there. Well, without a blood pressure cuff, I can't get an actual number. So what are you going to do? You're going to use what's called blood pressure by estimation. Now, that doesn't sound very good, estimating a blood pressure. But remember, we are in a wilderness or a backcountry setting, so we have what we have. But it actually is good enough for what we're trying to accomplish. We are trying to see, is our patient doing good? Are they still perfusing out to their organs? So I do blood pressure by estimation by figuring out, do they have certain pulse points? Every pulse point in your body requires a certain amount of pressure to get blood to it. Your blood pressure has to be at a certain level to get blood out to those pressure points. There are two components to blood pressure, the systolic and the diastolic. You might have heard of those numbers. You don't have to worry about those right now. The average blood pressure is 120 over 80. That's what the average is, 120 systolic, 80 diastolic. Again, you don't need to worry about that. What you just need to understand is that when I do a blood pressure by estimation, all I'm able to get is that systolic or the top number. That top number tells me if my heart is pushing blood out to the body. So that's what we're getting. Here are the pulse points you use. The first one is that radial pulse we already talked about. When I come down here and I check and my patient has a radial pulse, I feel it and it's nice and strong, it means that their systolic top number blood pressure is at least 90. That may not sound good, but it's actually fine. Now, it could be 150, but all I know is it's at least 90 because it takes that amount of pressure to get blood out to my radial artery. If I come along and my patient doesn't have a radial pulse, don't just say they're dead. We're going to check other pulses before we do that. But I check a radial pulse and there's no radial pulse. The next one I'm going to check for blood pressure is the femoral pulse. Now, the femoral pulse is very deep. If you're all sitting right now and you're trying to find this, you're not going to be able to. You need to be flat to find this. The femoral pulse sits between, right here, your hip bone or your iliac crest and your ischium, the top of your crotch. In there, there's a little valley. And if you put your hand in there with your fingers and you push in, you'll find your femoral pulse. If I don't have a radial pulse, but I do have a femoral pulse, my blood pressure is between 80 and 90. Now I come along, no radial pulse, no femoral pulse. They do have a carotid pulse. Well, now I know that my blood pressure is between 60 and 80 because it only takes 60, a pressure of 60 to get blood to my carotid artery, but I don't have enough to get it down here. This is further away, 
this is even further away. And if I don't have a carotid pulse, you should all know that, this person is deceased. No carotid pulse, we're gonna start CPR. So that's a lot of information, I understand that. But what are we using it for? Well, the nice thing is blood pressure kind of wraps up what we use vitals for altogether. Vital signs do not tell me about my patient. They do not tell me or diagnose my patient at a moment in time. Vital signs are only good for trending your patient. Change over time. The only reason we want vital signs is to start getting a trend. Get a set now. Get a set in 10 minutes. Get another one and another one and another one. And over a period of hours or days, look at that trend. Is my patient's condition improving? Are their vital signs getting better? Moving back to the average. Are they staying at that baseline and not changing? Or are they getting worse? They're deviating from that average in either direction. It tells me if my treatment is working, if I need to adjust my treatment, if I need to try something new, if I need to get a faster evacuation. Vital signs will never diagnose your patient. All vital signs will do is help trend your patient and guide your treatment over time.